Um, so I'm going to talk this morning about uh, sales, purchases, and rentals by non-U.S. owners of U.S. real estate. Let's define non-U.S. owners to start with. If you guys want to follow along, this color handout we'll start out with. It's called, on the front it says tax withholding on foreign citizens residents who sell U.S. California real estate. So if you don't have it, yeah, go ahead and grab There's three of them up there. If you don't have it, you want to follow along, grab them. I'll wait a second because you won't enjoy it if you don't have it. topic is about. It's about people who meet two criteria. Number one, they're not U.S. citizens. Number one, they're not U.S. citizens. Number two, neither are they U.S. legal residents. So the category of people we're talking about is people who buy U.S. real estate but who aren't U.S. citizens and they're also only allowed to be here as a guest, most countries allow, you know, for most countries we allow them to visit the United States up to three months a year, that's fine. Beyond that, they would need a special visa to be here. Canadians have a special deal, they get it up to six months a year. Um, so I'm not talking about you if you are a uh, green card holder or if you have a, a work visa that gives you the right to be in the United States full time. If you're a student who has the right to be in the United States full time year, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about non-U.S. people who are not allowed to be in the U.S. except as visitors, but nonetheless they're buying property. No shortage of these people. So, in the first handout, the color handout, tax withholding on foreign citizen residents, we're talking about what happens when a foreign citizen resident sells U.S. real estate. The biggest thing if you have foreign clients who are going to sell U.S. real estate to get, uh, get them prepared for is that almost certainly at the time of sale, the escrow guys are going to collect 10% of the gross sales price and not give it to them at the close. Now, it's not gone forever, but your sellers shouldn't be going and buying a new property the next day or already have committed that money because 10% of the gross sales price will be set aside, almost certainly, I can tell you what the almost is, at the time of close. So, for instance, if a uh, Chinese citizen buys property here in the you know East San Gabriel Valley or West San Gabriel Valley, excuse me, and they and they sell, let's say they buy it for eight hundred thousand dollars a few years ago, and now they're about to sell it for a million. Number one, tell your Chinese client that a hundred thousand is going to be held up by escrow. You're not getting that hundred thousand for a little while. Now, what happens to that hundred thousand? A couple things might happen. A escrow probably is going to feel compelled to send the 100000 into the IRS. That's what they're supposed to do. There's a twist to that. Um, the IRS then holds the 100000 The Chinese citizens will want to make a, file a tax return in the following year because he's probably due quite a sizable refund of that amount. Again, we tax in the United States, like most places, based on whether the property went up or down. So the fact that a hundred grand went into the IRS, so really only a security deposit to make sure that this Chinese citizen actually files U.S. taxes with respect to that property gain. And if they fail to do so, well, the U.S. will take their 100000 and thank you very much. But if they bought it for 800 and sold it for a million, they're probably due a refund of about $70,000. So simply by filing a tax return the next year, they'll get $70,000 back of the 100000 that went into the IRS. It had to go in again because it was a sale by not a U.S. citizen and not a U.S. legal resident. 
So the 100000 gets set aside. It's only temporary. Don't tell them it's not gone for good. So, but they'll have to play the game to get back the refund, okay? And I'll describe what they have to do in a second. Now, one twist to all this. If you sold in uh, January, February, March, beginning part of the year, for a million dollars in my hypothetical, but you really, uh, and they took 100000 and set it aside, but the real taxes were only thirty. when are you getting your $70,000 refund? Yeah, if, okay, so but if I if I sell in February of 2015, uh, when can I file? 2016. Okay, so the point is that's a whole year before I can even file to get my seventy thousand dollar refund. Much less wait for the refund. So now now we have a bit a bit of an imposition because now you're talking about a 15, 16 month wait to get the seventy grand back. They're not going to be very happy about that. There is a process which is called, and I'm going to direct you to it, on page 4, and you can see it in play in the example on page 5, called the 8288B process. It's pretty simple. It just says, it's, think of it as an in-year tax return special request to the IRS. Hey, guys, we don't want to wait a year and a half. They bought it for 800 They sold it for a million. The real tax is dirty. You have a hundred. Give us a break. You know, give us a break and send us back. The, or let us have our $70,000. And they will if you can prove all that. So it's definitely possible. But here's the real twist, I think. You need the escrow company, and I don't know what the policy is amongst the escrow companies here. I suspect um, uh, Juliana Two's group would do this, but I can't speak for sure. Um, you need the escrow company to agree. If you're dealing with foreign seller clients and your goal is to get them, which I would make a marketing effort out of this in a second, your goal is to get them back to withholding tax quickly, you need to use an escrow company who will agree to hold the $100,000 in their trust account as they are legally permitted to do and not send it in to the IRS. This is their choice. They don't have to do that. A lot of them don't want to do it because it's a little messy sometimes. But they can absolutely do this. If they hold the $100,000 in their trust account, as soon as the IRS agrees to your 8288B petition, call that two months, Escrow company merely sends seventy thousand to the Chinese buyer and sends in thirty to the IRS, and we're done. If it didn't go that way, an escrow company felt compelled to send a hundred grand in to the IRS. Yes, you could get approval to get your seventy thousand dollars back, but the problem is, you know, even with the approval of the the, uh, the go ahead from the IRS, it'll still take another four or five months for the IRS to actually write you a check. That's the problem. So you need if you're if you're making a marketing effort out of dealing with foreign sellers and you're getting into the, no, <clears throat> which I think is interesting, the notion of, look, I know how to get you guys these withholding, excess withholding taxes back quickly. You've got to use the escrows that will agree to hold it in their trust account. Otherwise, you can't really get it back that quickly. That's a key factor. Where I live out in Palm Springs area, <clears throat> almost all the escrow companies do this because they will lose business if they don't do it. We have a lot of Ch uh, Canadian sellers, and the Canadian sellers will jump ship to another escrow company if one doesn't do it. Whether that would happen here, whether they would know enough, the foreign people here, to, about all this and to jump ship if the escrow company didn't do it, I don't know. But are you guys as realtors, that's, that's, a, that's a marketing position I would take if you have foreign sellers. Not only do I know how the withholding rules, but by the way, I know how to get you your excess withholding tax back quickly. Don't have to wait a year and a half when you deal with me. I think it's interesting. Okay. On page 7, one important thing, when you have foreign sellers, they have to get their uh, tax, U.S. taxpayer ID number. And you need, well, a good realtor is going to help them get prepared for this. Because all of getting refunds and all the rest is presupposes that they've been organized enough to get a U.S. taxpayer ID number, which is not that easy. I go through the requirements on page 7. The biggest hurdle, I would say, is number 1. They've got to get their foreign passport certified. They can do this before the sale. Some of the stuff they can't. What does it mean to certify a foreign passport? It means the following. They take their passport and they either go into uh, their consulate in Los Angeles, which we're close to, but you'd have to check with the particular consulate if they will certify it. Because I don't think the Chinese consulate, for example, will. So if the Chinese consulate won't do it, we're in, that's, we're in trouble already a little bit. Number two choice is you can utilize what are called IRS acceptance agents. These are private practitioners. My company is one 
who are allowed to review the passports and certify them and basically do the service on behalf of the um, uh, foreign per, you know, person. I think you're, you're gonna, if the consulate won't do it, you're gonna really have to use one of these private individuals because the IRS office won't do it. So you can Google uh, IRS certifying acceptance agents in your office. You can call me, my office will do it. The one thing I get a little nervous about is about the random Google search is the W-7 application, which is the application for the number itself, is a little tricky, and if the people that you're using aren't used to getting taxpayer ID numbers for real estate sales, the potential for screw-ups are high. At least, at least want to know the people that you talk to, although they'll probably say yes, have some experience in getting the numbers in the real estate sale context. Um, a, so A, before the sale, get your, get your sellers their, get them organized and get their, certified pass, their passport certified. B, then you have to wait, unfortunately, until they enter into a sales contract to sell the real estate. You cannot get the, the ID number until they enter into the contract. So it, it's a bit of a race at that point because you want the number for a variety of reasons quickly, but you couldn't apply just when they put it on the market. You could, they wouldn't give it to you. So they'd only give it to you once you proved you need it. How do you prove you need it? Well, you show them a signed sales agreement and a couple other things, and then they'll give you the number. So before the sale, get their passport certified. Right as the sale is executed, but still prior to the close, get the number, call me, call a certifying acceptance agent. You want to raise to get these guys the number. All the, helping them get the taxes back quickly presupposes that they got the number, which is trickier than you think. So um, that's just one, one side note. Okay, um, that's all I want to say about selling. Remember, when you represent foreign sellers, they're going to have a 10% holdback. Prep them for that. Don't let them go spending the proceeds the next day. They, don't, they won't get them the next day. But if you do it right, you can get them all the proceeds back, minus the real taxes they owe, within a couple months after the close, provided you use an escrow that holds the 10% of the trust account. Number two, I'm going to slip, switch to a, the second handout, which is tax withholding requirements for Canadians. We have Canadians and all foreign citizens who rent U.S. property. Now, what I mean by this is, again, we're talking about non-U.S. citizens, non-U.S. legal residents who own real estate, but then who rent it out here to whomever and collect the rents back home. The big thing to note about rent collection is it's sort of like a sale in the sense that there has to be money held up and sent in to the IRS and not sent all the way back to China or wherever, or we have an IRS problem. If the property manager is the one collecting the checks, as is frequently the case, it's really their job to get, and the, and the flat rate, guys, by the way, is 30%, at least to start, the gross rents are supposed to be set aside, sent into the IRS, and then um, this can be undone by filling out some forms. But if, if somebody, if you're one of your clients buys property here, and you may or not, may not be involved at this point, and rents it out and collects the rents, and there is no amount deducted for taxes, and they have done nothing to register with the IRS, or the state of California for that matter, that's a time bomb waiting to happen. And anybody in the property management game who lets that happen is waiting to be put out of business. So uh, I don't think, uh, anybody property managers in here? Okay, property managers beware. Uh, property managers, because you're, you, you're, you're not a sympathetic figure here. You're in business to do this. So uh, don't let uh, amounts go right in, uh, unfettered back to the home country without, um, well, at least you can call me or whatever. There's, there's ways to get out of some of this stuff. I can't go into all the details in this short period. But just like sales, the IRS expects a chunk up front of rental income going back home. Although by simply registering and doing taxes every year, you can really get out of that. Lastly, on the, the third one I want to talk about, guys, is the non-U.S. person. Same people again, purchasing a U.S. home. What's the best form of ownership? I don't know how much you guys get involved with telling your clients how one should take title in homes, uh, how does it differ when it's a foreign person? Well, a little, I, I think. Um, we go through the various options, starting on page two. Uh, you know, certainly you can put it in your own name if it's one person. Husband and wife typically put it in joint tenancy. That's fine. I think community property with right of survivorship is just as the equivalent to joint tenancy um, for foreign people. But if you want to go ahead and say community property right of survivorship, great. The, the reason I say it's the equivalent for foreign people is that they're, if they're filling out the sales on their tax returns at home, they won't get the same benefits, so it won't matter. 
but it's a good one for Cal all American married couples should always use community property with the right survivorship unless they're using a trust or something because it gives the survivor on death the right to sell the house the next day for no gain, you know, no tax whatsoever, which is nice. Uh, tenants in common is for business people or for multiple families going in on a house. We, tenants in common is not for couples because tenants in common says when one person dies, their interest goes down according to their will and not just to the other owner. And that can involve a probate on, you know, half of a house or something. So tenants in common is for business people and friends, not for, you know, spouses and married couples or couples in general. Um, on page three, I talk about the horrors of California probate. It's expensive. It's kind of a pain when the person that you dies is from another country. There's some extra cost there. So I personally like to see, um, you know, at least a thought put into using regular trusts for foreign owners of U.S. real estate. Because if you don't do it and they own, they die owning the house here. The beneficiaries may be back in Asia, but somebody's going to have to come here if this, if this house was not put into a trust and deal with these California courts to get that house out of there. The only way around that, for the most part, is just using a, tr a basic trust. So at least when they die, it goes to the heirs, no matter where they are, without having to you know, mess with the California courts. It's quite a scene, of course, when everybody was from a foreign country and yet the California courts are unavoidable. That's certainly going to be the case, guys on all the ones I brought up on the first part of this discussion, at least after all the people die. You know, if there's a couple after the second couple dies, then the, for it to go to anybody else, it's going to have to go through the courts. So, big knock into probate. Um, on page four, I introduced the, I'm oh, sorry, on inter, you know, I talk about the U.S. Revocable Trust, I guess you had a probate. Sorry, on page five, I talk about the estate tax. Foreign people are also subject to the estate tax. And uh, this is a problem, too, because if they die owning U.S. real estate, um, they can owe a huge tax to the United States just based on the value of the real estate, a real hit. Uh, if they're from a treaty country, that's a big benefit. So Canadians have a pretty sweet deal. If they die, uh, they may have owned a million-dollar property in California, the United States and California, but there will be no estate tax unless they themselves had over $5.5 million uh, in worldwide wealth. But if a Chinese person owns a $200,000 condo around, not even here, somewhere else, and dies, they're going to owe estate tax on that. So it's, it all depends on where the, the country the person is from. Um, so the estate tax is a big problem for foreign people. It's a big boom at the end that they may not have been... Uh, looking out for. Now, how do you get, lastly, on page six, how do you get around the estate tax? Well, there's a few ways. Um, some of them are dicier than others. Uh, number six, I talk about using corporations to own the house, not the people themselves. It's also an intriguing idea, by the way, in case they're going to rent it out because maybe they want liability protection in case their tenants, you know, you know, crack their head in a pool or something like that. Um, corporations potentially can block the estate tax. I didn't own the, U the U.S. house uh, in my own name. I owned it in Chinese shares of Chinese company which owned U.S. home. So I didn't die owning U.S. real estate subject to the, the estate tax. I died owning Chinese shares, i.e. no estate tax. Okay, so, that, so that's a good way to block it potentially. Uh, partnerships, California LLC, no, California LLC would not block it. U.S. corporations would not block it. So foreign corporations owning the U.S. home, foreign partnerships maybe, foreign trusts on the bottom, um, all could block the estate tax. Again, if you're from a non-treaty country and these are older pe people, it's crazy almost to let them own it in their own name because as soon as they die, there's a, there's a tax on the value of the property itself and it's not, unless they're from a treaty country, it happens quick. It doesn't even have to be very much property at all. Lastly, on this back page, I also talk, I also spin in the concept of we want to rent it out, but we don't want to, you know, again, we want liability protection because we're worried that if one of our tenants uh, cracks their head in the pool that we'll get sued and even back home we'll, we'll be somehow subject to a judgment and we'll lose our life savings. But if you're going to rent out property all the time, definitely use a, a corporation, definitely use a limited partnership, not a regular partnership, an LLC, some vehicle that protects you from personal liability in cases of lawsuits. So, um, you know, I don't know where you draw the line. People who, in my area, who have a house that they rent to one tenant in a year and maybe another one in another year, I'm not sure it's, you know, worth it to go through the extra. They probably have insurance. 
to go through the extra costs of uh, forming corporations. But if you're renting these things out all the time, you got all these tenants, and who knows who they are? I don't think you have a choice because again, one accident could be your owner's life savings down the tubes, unless they have well insurance for certain. But who knows how much? You know, if it's a really bad accident, who knows if that'll cover it? So the second, you know, also consider having your clients who are going to get business properties to put them in some sort of limited liability vehicle so just in case, not that big of a cost, they don't have uh, personal liability issues. Questions on any of this? You're stunned. No. <laughs> okay, well my number, you can't sort of avoid it, so it's all over the place. Uh, feel free to call me if any of this stuff is interesting to you, if you have foreign seller clients. Uh, I again think on the sales side it's maybe the biggest. Get them ready for the 10% holdback. Get them their passports certified. Consider using escrow companies that hold the money so you can facilitate quick refunds. That's all good stuff and ways to maybe distinguish yourself from other realtors. Thank you.